Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Amina. Um, I'm the e resources expert in the library. Um, welcome today for attending the research tools at the um, for the graduate students and faculty members. Uh, and uh, inshallah, we'll start in just shortly. I'll just give the opportunity for more people to join. OK, um, I'll just move on to the next slide, um, welcoming everybody again. Uh, this today's session, uh, I've tried to compact as much information as I can. Uh, it's a very broad, broad topic. Uh, and I just want to make everybody aware that although the session today will be very broadly covered, uh, we are planning to develop more workshops specialized workshops on all the components you'll hear about today. So welcome everybody, relax, and uh, please, if you have any questions, just post them in the, uh, the chat box. We'll try to get back to answering them, um, and if not, I'll respond in writing an email to everybody. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, my name's Amina, and um, I'm the Electronic Resources Librarian at the UAEU. Um, and I put together this program. It's kind of a very customized program based on the tools that we have in the library, as well as some of the observations that uh, we've kind of come up with some of the ideas of best practice, perhaps uh, down the line. So the outline today, I'm just going to give you that general overview of the services and tools available at UAEU that specifically um, are related to research. Uh, or your thesis dissertations, so cover a whole variety of different areas. We'll talk about briefly about stages of research and try to map towards the tools and systems available. We'll talk briefly about ORCID IDs because um, I'm not sure about uh, maybe the new uh, graduates or new students may not be aware of the importance of ORCID. I won't go into too much detail either because we're going to be covering a lot more of all of these components in future workshops. I'll discuss the layers of the internet um, and how you conduct searches in these different layers. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the information search process uh, as well as free information out on the internet versus paid and comparing both uh, types of resources. Some of the evaluation tools and some of the methods that you could utilize uh, for evaluating websites and predatory journals using Cabels, for example, which is another tool we have at the library. And if we have time and lucky enough, we'll be able to go into a live demo um, and show you some of the areas that we covered in today's session. So moving on uh, to the next slide, this is uh, for many uh, probably faculty members who are new, they've probably seen the slide before. Uh, this is just to depict or highlight the areas of um, some of the databases, the indexes and abstracts and tools that we have available at the moment. At the center of all this is what we have or what we call the WorldCat Discovery. And um, it's the search engine or the Google version of the library. So the Google Scholar version of the library is WorldCat. Um, and it is a search engine. It's very specialized. It works very much and behaves very much like any search engine. However, it specializes from the front end, from the user that it accesses, as will give you access to all the resources that you see highlighted at the moment with much more. So the library has over hundreds of databases and platforms. Um, it's very difficult to actually just go through a simple alpha listing of all these products. Uh, so simply you just go into a search box on the web page and that you can begin there. So we'll talk about that um, and you'll see on the right hand side I've circled some of the scientific index indexes and abstracts and services and reference material or services or tools and also some subject databases and platforms. Um, and also down below here we're talking about uh, we'll be talking about ScholarWorks very briefly and I just want to highlight the fact that it is a it is an institutional repository uh, for uh, thesis and dissertations, electronic ones. It will be open access. It is open access. So again, most of these products are um, has have been around for a while at the university, but uh, up until recently, we're now utilizing it a little bit more in the research space and growing um, our collections across the board. Um, 
as well as at the other services that we have. And also there's a product here called Jove, it's mixed media. Um, you, it might be of interest to uh, some of the students and faculty because uh, there's a lot of uh, modules and I think it covers education and humanities, so you might find it interesting as well. Um, these are some of the products. I've just got some logos here. Uh, there's a lot more. I can fill the screen up, but I ran out of time and I'll cover some of them as we go along. Um, as you can see here, there's the ORCID uh, logo, the SkyVal from Elsevier, Alphmetric. So most of these tools that we use and utilize, uh, or you will be using and utilizing during your course of research. Um, and here is another mud map. Um, I'm a visual person um, and I, I like to see things from a kind of a, a top down view of what products we have. And this is not by no means comprehensive, but this is just a depiction, a small depiction of the possibilities of where you would go as a student, as a faculty member, while you're doing research. Um, some of the things that you see in circle here on the right hand side are products that are predominantly owned by one vendor called Elsevier. Um, and the other one is uh, the other circle. Most of those products are owned by Clarivate. And as you can see, they're kind of, they're, they overlap, they're similar, but they're not. Different metrics, there are different types of tools, there are different types of indexes, um, and sometimes you need to use both, sometimes you can do with one, but uh, that is kind of, uh, this, the majority of libraries around the world would have these tools available. Uh, what's not encircled here is some of the, you can see Google Scholar as well, which is another area that a lot of the users and students, uh, so researchers would go to uh, for background information. Uh, at any point in time, you might be involved in one or many of these tools available that you see on the screen at the moment. Center stage, a center to this all is Pure. Uh, Pure is our research information system. Um, it is in the process of being rolled out, so please stay tuned uh, if you see um, information in an email about workshops or training, uh, please attend. It's a vital tool that will help with the workflow, the research workflow for the university, but also for um, the users, the, the researchers and the uh, students, graduate students. Below Pure is WorldCat, which is the search engine I described around the library version of Google. And then you see ORCID, the ORCID ID here is also central to all of this. And although it isn't a system, however, it is important uh, for graduates, especially who have not registered to really go to the ORCID website and create a, a, an ORCID ID number. And um, I'll just show you another slide about that as well. Um, so that is kind of in a nutshell, our role in the library, we're trying to integrate uh, and not just integrate, but trying to get these each of these systems to talk to each other so that you don't have to sign in, sign out, remember passwords, usernames, and just lose track of where you are. Um, so that was the purpose of having Pure in this whole process, the system that will help you manage all of your research profiles, your activities, your uh, you know populating information. So wherever you are in the workflow of research, you'll be able to fall back on one source of truth called Pure. Um, and I'll, we will talk about that again um, in the future, your future, inshallah. Um, so this is ORCID for users who don't or haven't seen ORCID. If you're new to the research space, um, I urge you to go to the orchid.org page and sign up. You will receive or um, a unique ORCID ID number. This will be your research passport, passport ID. So wherever you are, wherever you go, you'll be able to take this ID and use it on any system or any service that are, uh, are compatible with ORCID. It will help in the future to manage uh, mostly long workflows, uh, especially during the process of preprint or postprint publishing and uh, trying to uh, claim author uh, titles that have disappeared from um, your collection of uh, works. So, um, so it will help you spend more time contributing, making work, developing um, and creating information, and less time managing them using the ORCID ID. And the ORCID ID is so vital across the systems because it's going to be a very unique match point across a variety of different systems. 
But from a user perspective, you only need to enter it once and it will populate your profile on any of the other systems. It's a growing area. The UAEU are uh, institutional members of ORCID. Uh, and as I said earlier, please attend any workshops that are presented by us in the future uh, to know a little bit more about it and how you can benefit using your ORCID ID. So um, just moving on very quickly, what is the information search process? Um, again, this is another diagram that just highlights different steps that you might need to go through during your research uh, process or search process for information, getting that background information. All the way from formulating that research question right in the beginning, thinking through your needs, uh, searching using the proper search tools, using search terms that are relevant, um, then conducting searches, then evaluating the output of that research that you do in these databases, um, and then reconsider other search tools and search terms, etc. And you evaluate, you constantly evaluate until you get to a point to the very end um, where you now need to critically evaluate the search results of everything you've done across the board. So it looks like there are multiple steps, but if you know the right databases to use, you're using the right terminology, if you're planning properly, this will be an easy process. So no one said research is easy, it's hard work. However, with proper planning, we can make that smooth for you uh, with the right proper tools um, and uh, you'll get across most of the difficulties in less time. So before you start, you need to conduct some pre-searches for background information. And I know many of you like the Google Scholar approach. By all means, we need to use Google Scholar. We're not saying that it is a bad system to use. But each database and each step or stage in the workflow or uh, the life cycle of your research requires different type of systems. So um, you do your pre-searches to get that background information. You create a plan, as I described earlier in the previous uh, screen. And then you start selecting information sources and databases to use. So the whole key here is to plan properly uh, from the very beginning. Um, so, and also when you're doing research or search across the board, it's essential to look for information beyond the places that you're most familiar with. Um, you can find almost anything using Google. Um, you can find almost anything using, you have other probably, probably uh, preferred databases or systems, but sometimes it's just good to try something different and have a look and see what's out there, what's different, what have I missed anything? Um, so with Google, it's great. It's a simple start, but it has its limitations and I'll describe what that is uh, shortly, especially when you're involved in the scholarly output. Uh, you need to actually be a little bit more vigorous in the selection of the databases you use. So I'm going to talk a little bit here about the Internet layers, and I'm pretty sure you all have heard of the dark, dark web, the deep web, the surface web. So these are kind of the three layers that are defined in the internet. Uh, there's a lot of literature on the internet about these three layers, but a lot of people get confused sometimes between what the deep web is and the dark web is, and it's not the same. So the surface web or the open web is what you see on the internet. It's all the free stuff, uh, and it's all what's in Google or on the search engines. Uh, you'll see all of that free stuff on the surface web. Um, and all of that information can be indexed by other search engines as well, it can be borrowed and harvested across. Um, the deep web is that layer that includes millions of databases and dynamic web pages that reside normally behind paywalls. So you have to pay for that information. Um, and it requires usually passwords, username and passwords, a special authentication. So there are kind of different levels of requirements from different vendors that will allow you to go in. So there's a lot of things that you need to do for them to let you into that behind that paywall to get the full text, to get to the real juicy information. Um, so this layer of uh, the Internet usually um, has high quality information, and this is what the library acquires on your behalf. We, we acquire all these different databases to make sure that you always have access to the appropriate resources for your research. The dark web is the deeper layer of the internet that no one hardly can get to. Um, it's anonymous. These sites are not freely available to the public. They're hidden uh, behind um, specific internet protocols and 
to ensure confidentiality. Um, so we we not go in there. Uh, it's not what we offering you or the, what the library has is not part of that deep web environment. So these are the three layers and our focus today will predominantly be what's in that deep web layer. The other area here I just want to highlight so that we understand the differences between the discovery tools. So when we talk about discovery tools um, in the information world or research world, discovery is actually the search engine. So it's the bit of your Google Scholar, but from the, for paid content. So the discovery tool we have in the library is part of that WorldCat discovery that I showed you earlier. Um, it's the library catalog in the old days, but gone of the days where we now just rely on card catalogs we use and now really have to rely on discovery tools and the suite of other modules like linking tools that will allow you to authenticate and open up access to full text content that is not available for free anywhere else. Um, so this should be your first stop discover discovery tool to, to subscription databases. And then the other area I want to talk about is the full text databases versus a lot of the abstract and indexing databases. And so you may go end up in an abstract and indexing database expecting to download a full text article and that doesn't happen. So while the ANI databases are very comprehensive, they're large, it's a great place to start searching. But if you find that it's hard to download a full text because it's not there or not linked to a full text, please ask us and we will obtain the article either on interlibrary loans or search for it from other sources for you. It is available. However, these databases serve the purpose of indexing way more than the full text articles because with full text, there's a lot of limitations from publishers. Uh, sometimes there are embargoes. Sometimes there are delayed publications. Um, they, there are different licensing agreements, copyright. All of these things play a role in why some of the journals don't publish their articles immediately. So um, we just need to be aware of that limitation. And when we do, um, when you do come across something you want to download and you need access to, just let us know and we will obtain it for you through interlibrary loan. So some of the databases here, which I picked very briefly for um, maybe the education uh, uh, um, department and students is we have many databases that provide um, multidisciplinary type of uh, uh, content. So we have Academic Search Complete, we have the ProQuest Search Complete, we have the EBSCO version of, EBSCO, of that search, Academic Search Complete, there's Psych Info, there's ERIC Education, which is a free index, but it's also re-indexed in many of these databases as well. You can use this as a tool to extract thesaurus and keywords for and subject headings. Then we have Scopus, the Elsevier product, the multidisciplinary uh, tool or uh, in, that indexes uh, millions of articles. Uh, it comes with a lot of tools and analytics, and so does the Web of Science from Clarivate. Um, and they were also in the diagram I showed you earlier, plus many, many more other databases that are worthy for you to explore in the systems. Um, and then you have Google and Google Scholar, of course, but are they suitable really for research, for the really rigorous type of research that is needed sometimes? Um, so um, we'll find out. So let's have a look. Uh, this is just a, a little comparison. I'm not going to go into this detail. Uh, you will get a copy of this PowerPoint to use as a reference. Um, this is just giving you an idea of the differences between the main databases of Scopus, Web of Science and Google Scholar. Uh, and you can see in Google Scholar, for example, there are a lot of unknowns, so they don't release a lot of information. That in itself sometimes depletes the authority of the system. Uh, and you can see uh, some of these areas uh, or features are at parity, so they're equivalent or higher or lower. Some of them are stronger in areas. So that's why we need both when we're conducting searches. So we can't do one without the other. Um, and again, so this is more features here about the strengths and weaknesses. Just to give you an idea, of if you're relying too much on Google Scholar, you're going to sometimes encounter some problems. So we really need to start right from the very beginning, correctly, selecting the right sources, the right databases, so that we end up in the right place when we finish and we don't realize that oh, we have a lot of gaps in our research that we haven't covered. So you really need to go through, no stone has been uh, uncovered. So we just, uh, that's just a comparison for you. 
So yes, keywords are key. So you need to start with your keywords. You need to find out what keywords that you need to use. Um, many of these databases are governed by these keywords and subject headings. If you're using the wrong keywords incorrectly, um, not using truncation or proper phrases, um, you might miss out on really good information or resources. So keywords are very important in your research, conducting research. And I know my colleague Asma has previously gone through some of the Boolean aspects, so and and or and not, uh, using truncation and phrases. So every database, it's really good to spend some time with the databases that you're using to see what format or preference, how does their search engine really work to pull out the most relevant, the most good, the most, the best quality type of uh, resources available to give you that coverage, that scope that you require. So how we evaluate resources, again, we're just going to go back to the basics. And I know, again, Asma, my colleague, has touched on the primary and secondary resources. But the evaluation goes beyond identifying source types. Um, so we really need to make that distinction between what a primary source is and a secondary resources or sources. Um, and I've just got a lot of text here, but I know you probably have heard of it before, but um, with the databases, this is the distinction. So you need to know what databases you're using for what um, and what tools are you using for what. Um, and uh, to help you uh, distinguish between the two and uh, that give you different things, different outputs. So as a general rule, secondary sources give you authoritative points to support your argument, while primary sources give you raw material to analyze. So those are kind of the two distinctions between both of those. And the different databases will offer you different things uh, in, that, in that respect. So again, now this brings me to scholarly journals. And again, I think there's some uh, confusion between what a scholarly journal is and a peer reviewed article is. What does it all mean? So the databases contain these scholarly journals. They pay a lot of money, especially aggregated databases to publishers so that they can host that content on their systems. It's a very costly process and it's a huge supply chain, which we can't go into any detail here, but it's a very complex supply chain. Um, and that ensures copyright, um, open access, and the various forms of open access. There's a lot of going on at the moment as we speak with universities around the world about the ownership and copyright and open access of these, of these different products. So scholarly journals are among the most authoritative sources we have. They can give you excellent support for any argument, for your arguments um, in your research. There are several reasons articles and scholarly journals are authoritative. The biggest is it's peer review. So it means that the process is a process of due diligence to make sure that the articles going in the journal um, is not, it has been reviewed by a group of expert or committees of expert people, uh, doctors, professors uh, in that field that can peer review that process. So it, it just enhances the quality of the articles and the journal titles itself. And this is all important. So this is some information here about the peer review and when you're using secondary resources or sources, um, can you trust the information? Is it quite the same thing? All of this information is here in this uh, slide for you to have a read. Um, and uh, it talks about the ways peer review minimizes biases and incompetence in articles. So we make sure that the content of each journal is correct and up to standard. Um, I just touched here about books and ebooks as well because they do play a role. And even though uh, non scholarly books aren't written by scholars, they don't undergo this rigorous review that we talked about earlier. But they can give you something. Um, so they can put things in context. So um, historical non fiction books, for example, can give you a distillation of a predominant social view from a particular era. And I think that's sometimes important, maybe your research fields. And we do have a very good database called Gale Digital Scholar Database that covers this quite well. So it will take you back to the resources back in the 1800s or 1600s and show you how things were done or said or studied back then. So uh, there are specialized resources for that if you ever need that. So again, I um, recommend if you are in that space to have a look at the Gale Digital Scholar Database. Um, and if you are interested in any training, we can arrange that with the vendors as well. 
Um, we come now to evaluating websites. So I know a lot of us quote websites when we're doing research um, for uh, citations and things. So um, the top level domain. So we need to also start to question the website that we're on. So we have top level domains and those are like the .edu, .gov. Those are restricted domains usually. Um, and those restricted domains means that they're high quality um, and they're um, kind of credible resources for you to use um, versus something from .com or something that is kind of ambiguous. And if the, it's not very clear, always question the owner of the website. Uh, what are their, what's the agenda? Who's the owner of these websites? Just to make sure that the information that you have is reliable um, and it's taken from a source. So these are just some of the tips that you may want to just be aware of when reviewing websites. Um, I would put in the predatory journal topic here. It's a very big topic and we, we, we will be conducting workshops and some information about it. Um, it's a new form of academic scam and for the new researchers in this field, please watch out for these type of scams uh, who use usually the open access model as an excuse to get, um, they use the open access model. Um, they're actually fake journals with poor academic peer review and editing processes if any at all. They provide, they send mass emails and inv invites, invitations to researchers and academics to quick publishing. So they promised a quick publishing process. They, um, they earn money on the article processing fees and, and, and they have very well designed journal homepages. So you can really can't tell that these journals are predatory. Um, and predatory journals are very broad terms. Sometimes you might have some good journals that are classified as predatory, but really they're not. They're just young journals. They haven't been in the space for very long. Um, and uh, we just have systems now in place that will help us identify and scan this environment to find out the history of these journals, uh, if, they, if you ever come across them. So usually uh, they come across well designed, you come across a very well designed web page like this one. This is a courtesy of my colleague Linda from the Medical Library, who's giving examples and workshops about this topic as we speak. Um, and predatory journals are across the board. They're not just for medical, but they are a big issue for the medical environment. Because as we know now, we hear about the COVID-19 all this uh, fake information that is out there and studies that are out there. So this is of really high importance and for you to understand. So you can see here, you'll see the open access logo. So you, you see that this web page looks very legitimate, but in fact it isn't. Um, they, this is another hijacked journal. So what some places they're very tricky. Some publishers, they publish journals with similar names. So you really can't tell which is the good, which is the bad. So um, this happens quite a lot. Uh, so you need to as well be aware of these types of similar titles. The predatory journals can be found in core academic databases sometimes. Um, and they're really available on the web, widely available on the web. But the good database has clear guidelines because as I mentioned earlier, you may have good quality articles written by great academics in maybe unknown journals, but it doesn't necessarily equate to that journal being bad. It just means that this journal is still very young. It still hasn't proven itself. So these sometimes type of articles find their way into some of the special databases. Um, do we have a product called Cabells that helps with the predatory reports, uh, generates reports about journals. So you can actually do a search and find out uh, a lot more about that journal. And it will tell you the violations. It will tell you if you open up the journal, you'll see a, a long report about this journal and whether it's predatory or not. So uh, this is available from our web page. If you're interested, have a look. You can type in your search title of the journal or ISSN number. Sometimes many of these predatory journals don't even have an ISSN number. Um, and uh, you'll be able to see uh, some of the reports done there. So when you're in Google Scholar and you see a journal, beware of those type of journals in that system um, or in that search engine. So we're here for any assistance. Uh, please let us know if you need assistance with registering your ORCID ID or any of the information that you heard of today. Uh, please let us know. I'm happy, our team are happy to assist you 
uh, to go through uh, some of the steps in more detail, uh, especially with the uh, specialized databases. Um, I've left you some useful links here uh, as well. And uh, if we have no questions, how are we going for time? I can switch to a demo for um, a little bit. Do we have any questions? Um, yes, we have. Yes, OK, I'm just reading them now. So yes, uh, uh, Dr. Meyer, your question about the WorldCat system. It is in uh, on our home page, the search box. But I'll just go in there now, switch it into uh, our home page to show you where you can go to begin your searches. Yes, it is still work in progress. Um, WorldCat, I forgot to mention, is new to the library at, o at UAEU. Uh, we are enhancing the discovery as we speak. We're just waiting for some implementations, new enhancements, uh, and uh, to bring it up so that we'll deep search across all the databases. Um, and uh, all our systems, uh, WorldCat is a search engine. However, it does need that additional um, enhancement, as I talked about. So, okay, I'll just go into the web page now, share my screen. Uh, can anybody, everybody see uh, the home page? Yes. Good. OK. Um, so this is the English side of our homepage. We have an Arabic one so uh, as well. Uh, so at the moment, again, our homepage is also under development. We're looking at other tools to help us content manage our products on the system. Um, so you can see the search box below here. I'm just going to scroll down and just move this. This is the main box, but you really um, can start from this search area here. It will also take you to the discovery layer WorldCat. So this is what WorldCat is. I just want to point out, make sure that you're signed in, you're authenticated. If you're off campus, uh, you'll see a single sign on box that will pop up usually with your institutional login, just like now. Um, and you just sign in. And this is just a way of authenticating to get into the system. Uh, if you click on advanced search, before you commence, you'll see all the boxes appear uh, with all the search fields and you can actually select uh, a variety of different uh, uh, fields here uh, to begin your search. On the right hand side, you'll see a facet of different databases that this search index is going to cover and search across. So business source complete is there. Um, you've got uh, academic search complete in there. So what the search engine is doing now is going to search across all these ticked databases. If you want to remove any databases that you do not want to search across, you can actually remove and untick them. Uh, however, you can also do another filter on the left hand side and just like selecting only peer reviewed type of articles or just open access. So you can have these options. You can limit and narrow your searches by selecting these um, uh, boxes on the side here, even with the formats. Um, and also at the moment, the system will search across just what the UAE U libraries hold, not the libraries worldwide. Uh, so you can conduct your searches beginning from here. Um, I've just done uh, some other things that I wanted to show you previously. Yeah, so if I were to search um, on a keyword education and just put COVID in and the period of COVID-19, I can pull out maybe a lot of information. It's searching all the databases that have been ticked. Um, and you can see the reports. And then on the side here now, you'll see further options to narrow down your search. So there, don't worry about the numbers too much. Uh, just you can narrow your searches by clicking. If you're just looking at articles, you can click on articles. If you want book chapters, um, etc. So you can see the beautiful text, meaning that this journal is available full text from our collection. 
there's an option here to cite so you can actually cite this topic uh, if i expand by clicking on the journal or that uh, report or record i will see uh, the journal and where it's present it's in the academic search complete if for any reason you can't get to the report or record just click on the report a broken link it will come to us and we'll try to assist you if for other any reason that journal is also on an embargo and you can't get to the full text then we can also help you with an interlibrary loan you can view the description um, and you can also copy the links you can email you can save the searches so um, if I click on the view full text it will take me out through a linker um, to the EBSCOhost database because I, I think there was a query earlier on so this is um, the record in EBSCOhost it's going to give me the PDF and full text it's giving me now options so every database also have embedded tools so many databases now are part of the bigger platform for um, other tools and many databases, their mainstream features now are the email, uh, you can save the links, you can print, you can save to a, um, a shared drive. So are they giving you this option? So here we go, we have the actual article full text available to us. Um, if I um, utilize this, uh, the features here below about citations, you'll see these options available here to export in the citation style that is relevant to you as well. Um, and you can see now it's applied the Boolean logic of the AND um, automatically because I used the boxes and under the advanced searches. Just remember to make sure that you're always authenticated. Your name always has to appear up here because if you are not authenticated, your name doesn't show, you'll go in as a guest meaning that you might hit a paywall. So if you do hit a paywall from a publisher website telling you need to pay for the subscription, just go back to ensure that you are actually authenticated. This is very common when you're off campus, not on campus, uh, but when you're off campus, the system thinks that you're just a guest. It doesn't recognize you as a staff or student from the UAEU um, and publishers won't let you into their websites. So that is just a simple search that we've conducted um, within you in the system on WorldCat. I'm just going to go back out uh, to our main page again. We will be offering more in-depth sessions with um, OCLC and WorldCat. So search is the link here. This is the discovery search. So if you just want to see a broader view of things, just use the box down below. Um, and there are other services here. So the tools down here on the right hand side, a lot of tools here are actually related to research tools and um, citations. So you've got Scopus, SkyVal, you've got the Pure Portal in the future. Once you have a registration ID, you'll be able to get in. So we're working towards that. Uh, you'll have a list of databases here from uh, the uh, main page, but um, sometimes it's good to use these links, especially if you're offline or actually off campus, use the A to Z databases and you'll see a long list of all the databases. If you were looking for something very specialized, uh, you'll be able to go in here directly to the database itself, straight to the provider um, using the link. And in your here, you're in the EBSCO host system. You'll be able to conduct your advanced searches You'll be able to choose other databases because we searched only one, so you can search across all of the databases as well. Um, and this is a small collection. Every vendor we have, we support some of the gaps from one vendor by another vendor. So we also have ProQuest. Um, and it's always good to look at some of the key features of these databases. They offer a lot of other services embedded in them. Uh, so you can conduct the similar search that we did in OCLC through here and you probably get the same result and probably even more if you selected other databases. It will also give you citation tools. Um, you'll be able to download the title list of this, of this database as well. Um, scrolling down, you can also apply some limiters. Uh, so this is kind of mainstream across all the databases. You'll see these features uh, available. Uh, especially the good ones. And if you run into any issues, you can always uh, send us an email straight from within the system here as well. Um, 
I'm just going to go into LibGuide. So we have a product, uh, we have our own LibGuides. Again, that is still uh, under development. Uh, but it's always good to use and have a look at other LibGuides from other universities around the world who are um, really well advanced in putting together their LibGuides. Um, and uh, the LibGuides here is just a link that will take you, they're just instructional or overview content about the databases. So um, users will be able to come in here, can go to the go to the A to Z list in the same manner. Um, and you can see again, uh, the most popular databases and you can just alphabetically search across uh, what's available as well in here. Um, so any questions? I'm just going to go through the list and see if there are any questions. OK. All right, so there's an interest in the uh, confidence as a tool in the section. This is used for systematic reviews, correct? Yes from Najla. Yes, you are correct. We have some tools. Uh, we have two links, actually, uh, I forgot to mention. To the, we've got the main library, but we've also got the National Medical Library uh, for uh, really sophisticated research tools in there. If you're interested, just click on the link there and you'll go in and you'll see um, their side of the world uh, with their specialized tools. And they have a lot of information they put together over the years of um, especially they call them not lib guides they call them nml guides um, and uh, so there's actually all the different types of information that you need that pertain to the medical and health uh, sectors which sometimes might cross over into your area and um, yes uh, we are planning to do a workshop on predatory journals it's a big topic um, i just pulled out snippets today just to give you a taste that just beware because I know uh, people fall into the trap of, uh, of predatory journals very easily. OK, um, are there anything? Uh, no problems. You're welcome, everybody. Um, I know there's a lot more I probably missed today in the live demo, but I know it's the last day for a long weekend. Inshallah, I'm around. Please, I've got to the, you've got my email address. Please contact me if you need anything specific or you have any problems. I'm here to help you with the team. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I think there's a, um, a list of journals, just a query here before, I don't know if anybody's still around, um, uh, about how do we get to journals in a specific field. And uh, there are a couple of ways of doing Very good question, and I'm sorry I missed that. So we have a list of A to Z journals here uh, of all the journals that we have in our collections. You can do the search within um, WorldCat um, and if you have the name of the journal. However, we also have a tool, very good tool, and I, my colleague uh, Asma covered this in a previous session. It's called Browsine. So Browsine is all the list of journals we subscribe to. It's not a database in itself as such. It's more of a table of contents of all the journals uh, that we subscribe to. So you can search uh, by topic. So it's multidisciplinary here, you can see. Um, and if you click on one of the topics you'll see all the journals that are under social science and behavioral science. Uh, under education, you'll see all the journals that we have in our collection. Um, you can sort by journal ranking as well. So you can see the SJRs of these journals. Um, and then it has some features as well within the system. So you see my bookshelf, you can create your own bookshelf uh, your articles, and if you have uh, any queries, just let us know. It will take you. There's a link here that takes uh, you to an email 
to our, our service. This is a mobile application as well, so it's uh, mobile friendly, so you can use it on any device. Um, and uh, you can create user settings, so you can create and embed other settings in there as well. So this is the general browsing library. It's giving you its own independent search box, so you can search for titles of the journals. But it isn't a system where you can search for articles within the journals, uh, if you so, if you understand. So to do that, you need to go to places like EBSCO or ProQuest or Gale or any of the other services that we have uh, to do that in-depth article level searching. So this is purely title level and issue level. So if I click on here and I pick a journal, um, any of these journals, you will see options to download and share, export the citations, save to articles or link the article. If it's a journal we subscribe to, we subscribe to and there's no embargoes, you'll be able to download it. Um, and you can see um, our logo appearing there, meaning that you're in the UAE environment and domain. Um, and there you go. So it's referring you to a ProQuest PDF. So you can see now that it's found this article in one of the other databases. So it's a powerful tool. Uh, it's highly underutilized, so I really recommend you use it and create your own bookshelves and you can receive alerts every time there are new issues of journals or on topics that are of interest to you. So hopefully this um, also addresses the question. Okay, so I think um, without further ado, if there are no questions. Um, I think there are no more questions. Thank you very much, everybody, and it was a pleasure um, having you with me today. Thank you.